Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's August 30th. Today is the community meeting for OpenSearch. Glad everyone's here. Thanks for coming. We've got some great content for you today. As usual, we've got two presenters today. Uh, before we get to too much bulk of the uh, content here, I'm going to go through some etiquette that we usually always cover. Please do introduce yourself before speaking. Oh, by the way, I'm Nate Boot. I'm a developer advocate for the OpenSearch team. If you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to me. I'm always happy to, to have uh, conversations. Uh, please mute, mute yourself unless actively speaking. The cameras are, of course, optional. Not everyone's comfortable with those. Questions at any time during the chat or uh, on audio using your mic. And uh, disruptive folks, I'm afraid, will have to be bounced. I guess that's a colloquialism for removed, for those of you who've never worked in a bar before. Uh, we've taken some additional measures. Uh, screen annotations have been turned off, so no, no drawing frowny faces on the screen. Uh, profiles only show names. Uh, only hosts or co-hosts can share their screen. Uh, additional co-hosts uh, to make sure that uh, we can we can bounce uh, people that are disruptive. And uh, of course, we have to type in a passcode now to join the meeting, uh, just to make sure people who are here are the ones who want to be here. Uh, we appreciate you guys uh, going going through all that. So uh, that's it. I think we might have an announcement or two before we move on to some of the content. So I'm happy to go over that for you. Oh yes, uh, open open search con the the beautiful Fremont Studios in Seattle. Uh, it looks like you know if everyone who has registered is attending, uh, looks like we're starting to reach capacity at the venue. Uh, so please do register if you plan to attend. Uh, it's uh, I do encourage you to register as soon as you can because um, it has been made pretty clear that if uh, you have not registered, uh, there will be no entry. And of course the uh, Bi-weekly advertisement, Open Search Con, September 21st in Seattle, Washington at Fremont Studios. I hope everyone's going. And I think that's all I had to mention. Uh, this is our community meeting. Um, we have an agenda day of uh, two great presenters. We have Canonical here, uh, a representative from Canonical, you know, the people behind Ubuntu. And we also have Jay Katri, uh, founder of Highlight, here to talk about uh, his product, Highlight. And with that, I think we can take it away. Uh, looks like Canonical's up first. Uh, uh, Pedro, that's you, right? Okay. Um, so my name is Pedro. It's an absolute pleasure talk, talking to you guys here, um, to you folks. Um, I'm also joined by Michelle, who is probably um, also in this meeting. Um, it's not going to be presenting today, but we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, regarding to what we're going to talk about today. She's actually leading this whole initiative. And kindly um, let me uh, present this, this very cool um, project here. Um, I am originally an electric engineer, and I just like building things. And uh, I first I got, first first got intro introduced to open so, oh, to open source, apologies, um, with, I think, the second or third version of the Arduino serial. And since then, um, open source has been a big topic in my life. I've always been advocating open source alternatives, not only because, well, they're free, and uh, but also because um, the community of learning around it is so huge and so important, so uh, beautiful. And that's what I've been seeking in my career. How can I give the same experience to other people who are uh, um, also trying to learn new technologies and, and uh, who just need to you know their hands held sometimes to, to learn these new technologies. And I think that's kind of the inspiration of this conversation. So if I change the title a little bit, I apologize. The content is the same. Um, it's almost a passionate rant about uh, the current state of open source. And then some of the um, uh, my views or canonical views in some way on how we can uh, solve some of the issues we encounter today. So first of all, let's go back a bit in time about 18 years ago. Um, if you look at this graph, which represents access to broadband internet um, 18 years ago, you notice that, uh, well, 2004, less than 4% of the world population had access to broadband. And we might look at those times in a very romantic way where we would be um, waiting a lot of time for, I was going to say music, but I, I prefer to say an important document to download um, uh, the whole night and, 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 and 
you, you couldn't call anyone in the meantime and so on. It could look very romantic like that. But if you think about the perspective of open source and access to open source, that might have been um, a bit more complicated in terms, in terms of that. Um, if you wanted to have access to Linux, you'd have to know someone that had a CD to share, to make a copy for you. You would have to have access to uh, university backbone connection to download the new distro and then updating it and getting new versions would be a bit of a nightmare. So it makes you think like, um, well, while the source code for Linux, and I'm talking about Linux because it was the most popular open source product by, project by the time, uh, by the time and the series, um, but if you want to make a reflection about it, was um, actually Linux an open source project? Well, it, it was because the source code was, was available, but still it was not accessible by most of the world population. By, by default, you would eliminate everyone that did not have access to broadband or most people did not have access to broadband. And I'm not saying that it was the Linux Foundation obligation to install broadband connections in everyone's houses, but um, I want to take this example as an opportunity to think about what we truly want to achieve in terms of definition of open source for our projects for upstream communities. And uh, it's a reflection that I propose uh, to everyone and I'm also proposing here for the open source community. What, what it actually means, what is our definition of, of open source? Well, uh, back in the day, um, Canonical, the company that I work for, um, started just sending Linux via mail because that was uh, more accessible to people like me in the south of Brazil, where you did not have access to broadband, broadband connection, but you still, wanted, you still had some good ideas that could be implemented with Linux. And that these CDs, these mails, these packages really uh, changed my life in a way, because I started having access to, to Linux and start playing with Linux and, and, and developing projects and creating solutions and, and having fun. And then I decided to go to uh, university because uh, I was having so much fun with that and that defined my career uh, and my hobbies and everything. So in a way, this is a very powerful thing. If we can go back to the fact that we are all humans here and we all, um, you know, <laughs> we all have um, some basic uh, barriers stopping us from consuming certain open source projects. Uh, I think that we, we start realizing that uh, open source is not just a bunch of codes thrown on GitHub and forgotten. For, for PR reasons, uh, just to call your corporation, your organization open source. That's not open source, in my opinion. Um, so that's the reflection that I wanted to make. So what, what I think nowadays are some of these barriers for adoption of open source, and I promise I'm gonna get to um, Kubernetes operator in a, operators in a second. Um, so nowadays, I think that if you think about, again, about, I don't know, 18 years ago, you had developers in the operations separated by a bunch of, tickets to the IT department. If you wanted a new VM in your, in your machine, you would have to send a, a ticket and someone from the IT department would create for you and give you the credentials or whatever equivalent you experience. But I'm sure that some of you who have been in this journey for, for um, a bit longer will, will know similar stories. Um, and with the, the whole agile way of thinking uh, being, you know, the, the, the uh, being in the in the center spot for this this for development, uh, well, engineers started thinking about ways to 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 get closer to the operations, to the substrates, to the infrastructure, to the actual clusters, to getting their hands dirty with um, uh, with 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 um, the actual underlying infrastructure, and they didn't have didn't engineers never had never had a problem with that. So they engineers do whatever they need to do to solve problems. Uh, so um, that's one of the thinkings behind the concept of DevOps, right? You you you, you care about your beautiful uh, algorithm as much as you care about the runtime. And if I think about from a few years now, I think that we are kind of separating these two uh, roles again. And it's okay. Like I mean, there are excellent admins that are passionate about their jobs, they're excellent developers, data scientists who are excellent at their jobs. I'm not saying that every admin should care about algorithms and every uh, data scientist should care about Kubernetes clusters, but um, I think that everyone should have the right to, uh, to have access to these technologies. And um, we started thinking about what are some of these um, blocks, what, what are some of these barriers that separate the developers and the operational people or the operational infrastructure. Um, you have vendor locking. It's hard to, to, 
to, to integrate uh, tools across uh, across uh, vendors and have replicability. Re 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 it's very hard to sometimes transfer some of the know-how from one organization to another when you leave the organization and go to another organization or you learn, you read a tutorial that was written by a certain in a blog post with an organization when you try to implement in yours, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Um, integration with the whole cloud native world, the, the integration between microservices uh, became um, something uh, absolutely fundamental when you're thinking about running your workloads and uh, quality and security as well. Um, and th that's a very interesting point. I'm very passionate about that. And, and so I'm gonna spend a bit more time talking about it. Open source is here to stay. No one's gonna take open source out of the, the conversation. It, it, it is here, it's an objective truth. Um, what we need to think about now is who is going to offer the same level of support and, and maintainability um, to these projects, who is going to, um, uh, um, uh, how, how these communities are going to um, offer this, this, this great level of support to the users of these uh, open source projects, to this code base. And um, so that's a very interesting question. How do we, uh, how do we do that? Because developers are not going to use code bases that are not uh, securely maintained so on. So anyways, can go on and on about it. So if I could summarize it, it uh, summarizes all these problems in my view, uh, I think that uh, we're talking, talking here about operational complexity and operational complexity of uh, the workloads is the biggest issue in, in our decade in terms of uh, mm -hmm. running these workloads and operating these workloads in distributed systems uh, more specifically, multi-hybrid clouds uh, deployments. How do we operate this, this, these applications? I think is the big thing uh, for us trying to do, for us try to solve nowadays as, as upstream communities. Um, so summarizing this whole presentation in just one thing is that we're all used to having the application source code available everywhere, um, or all the other the code available uh, you know, in, uh, for us freely available that's what I mean um but the, the biggest question here is about the operational knowledge the the no the operations of uh, our services of our workloads are getting increasingly more difficult with, with you know just thinking about microservices here so uh, the big biggest challenge now is um how do we also share the know-how on how to operate this um this this workloads I think that by now you understand how important it is because uh, if you have a very complicated thing, you can make it as, as open source as you want, but if you do not have good documentation, and documentation is the best example of operational knowledge, uh, sharing, if you do not have good documentation, no one's gonna be able to use it. Uh, but we can go a step further and talk about automation and, and that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, today in the second half of my presentation. Um, so, what we have here at Canonical is an, uh, an open source project, 100% open source is most things that we do at Canonical. Um, it is uh, called Juju, and Juju is the Charm Operator frame Framework. And if you're familiar with the concept of operators in Kubernetes, the operator pattern, uh, Juju is not going to be too unfamiliar. Um, you have basically two parts, the Charmed Operators, which are just uh, Kubernetes operators written uh, with the Charmed Operator Framework. And they are the applications, the unchanged OCI images, and the operational knowledge distilled into Python code. So it's like you write uh, all the actions and configurations and everything into Python code, and, and you encapsulate that in, with, uh, with the OCI image. And that's where your charmed operator is, or your charms are. And you ha also have the operator lifecycle manager. By nature, an operator needs to have a lifecycle manager, and that's that's what the OLM, the Juju, Juju OLM is. And you might be asking yourselves, or I was asking myself before joining Canonical, why Canonical is dealing with this, this talking about these things. Um, and the answer is, well, people like developing on Ubuntu, that's a fact. Uh, developers, that, data scientists and so on, they like Ubuntu, and when they go to production, they also use Ubuntu. So Canonical created a series of professional offerings and, and enterprise uh, support and so on. And um, uh, that helps not only people who pay Canonical, but also everyone that has access to this open source code bases to run uh, Ubuntu in production uh, in a healthy and sustainable way. And um, when people started liking uh, to create images and deploy them in distributed systems, Kubernetes, OpenStack, or everything there, um, we also thought, okay, so we need to, to, to 
follow this trend in terms of uh, we need we need to continue to offer to continue continue to offer a great level of support of, of for Ubuntu and that's uh, a little bit where 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 Juju comes from and Juju proceeds actually Kubernetes by by six seven years it was working uh, initially on VMs and, and machine uh, we were creating machine operators and still an operator in Juju is an universal one you can you can apply it on both Kubernetes and your machines. Um, but that's kind of the logic why Canonic is talking about Kubernetes and operators. It's just because people use Ubuntu and, and Kubernetes and, and uh, the deploy operators um, with workloads built in, on Ubuntu. So when I'm talking, when I'm talking about um, multi-hybrid cloud, that's um, that's uh, something that we keep very close to our heart here uh, at Canonical and the, the Juju project specifically. And what it means in practice is that you can have whatever cloud you want, whatever substrate you, you want. You do not care if it's something that, that is supported by Canonical or commercially supported by Canonical or not. Um, you can have any mix or match between these uh, substrates, between machines or, or Kubernetes clusters, uh, public, private, uh, uh, whatever you want. And on top of that, you can bootstrap Juju. Once you bootstrap Juju, then you create this, this uh, kind of virtual, virtual layer of abstraction uh, that allows you to deploy your, your charmed operators that can be built locally, or you can uh, find uh, about 350 of them on, on charmhub.io. So that's kind of the logic between this uh, about uh, Juju and the fact that it uh, enables people to start thinking in a, a vendor agnostic way into, when deploying their applications. Um, to, I thought about going further into the architecture, architecture of Juju, but I think I would. Uh, um, uh, I thought about giving a more practical example. So um, this was a demo that I created a few months ago, and it's called Cloud Native on Rails. I promise you it has nothing to do with Ruby, so please do not leave the call um, if you do not like it. Um, I, I had that happening before, so uh, well, just, just a disclaimer. Um, and it's an, an actual Rails. It's not a virtual Rails. What we've done here is um, we had a microkits cluster running on a laptop, and it's one of the old, old Dell ones, Dell uh, Latsu ones that has an um, EPCI uh, slot, so you can connect a GPS module in, in your laptop, and then you can just, uh, there's a, someone, a hero out there, create a Python library for it, and then you can ha have access to your, to your coordinates or where your laptop is. That could be another I'm talking about that, that. I'm sure I could find a USB GPS module from out there. But anyways, uh, that, that, that's the fun of, of hacking the systems. Um, so uh, I wrote this latency.py uh, script, which keeps querying um, my EKS cluster and my GKE cluster. And um, we'll measure what is the latency between my laptop and uh, each of these this clusters. My laptop was. Um, gracefully handed over to a friend of mine who works at Scott Rail, the train operator in Scotland. And I forgot my laptop with him for a few weeks. And um, what I'm trying to achieve here is to prove that a workload that is deployed on my laptop can integrate to any of these clouds very dynamically. And um, Nginx and Postgres on, on this cloud, this is a, is a, it's exactly the same stack. They run exactly the same Juju commands to run on these two clouds. And I'm dynamically just changing what, po what Postgres instance um, feeds data into my Waltz, which is a financial modeling application that we've charmed uh, in cooperation with Deutsche Bank later, uh, early, uh, early in this year. And uh, so that's kind of the idea. And the re end result is, is much more interesting than you in my thing. So it is a map of uh, United Kingdom in terms of uh, the latency between the train and uh, the cloud that I'm. That I'm connected to. So uh, the trace in yellow is uh, the regions where the latency between my laptop or the, the rails and uh, my ECAS cluster was lower than the latency between the rails and a GK cluster and in blue is the opposite. So if you go for the East Coast, you, you might uh, prefer to use GK if you're, if you're caring about the latency. And if you're going through the West Coast, you might want to use um, Amazon services. Um, so that's just an interesting way to show that with this um, with this architecture, what we're essentially doing here is, is yeah, yeah, the, the deploying things in a train and putting in train by so on. But what we're essentially doing is relating things that are in different clouds 
uh, deploying the same stack on, 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 uh, of operators in the clouds without changing a single line in them. And what that uh, gives you is the ability to replicate your deployment across organizations. The moment you have an artifact, being whatever your artifact is, and you change a, sim a single string in the artifact, um, it, kind of, it kind of loses value. Because now, um, don't get me wrong, okay, you're encouraged to change whatever you want in your, in your open source code. But what I mean is that an operator is supposed to be written by a specialist, and that specialist curates the code in an operator. I'm talking about keeping the Kubernetes yeah, operator pattern post. Um, and if you need to change something, if you if you if you're required to change something to accommodate your deployment, to accommodate your infrastructure, then it kind of misses the, the purpose of having reusable reusable uh, operational code. Um, you wish there was a simpler way to do that through some uh, configurations and to have, to have defaults and have uh, more predetermined values. So that's kind of what uh, you can do with charmed operators. Um, what we are trying finally here, uh, what we're trying to achieve in terms of a partnership with open search. Um, well, and we want to deploy open search with um, Juju. That's in a, we could summarize in a single sentence. That's what we want to do because we think open search is very cool. And uh, um, yeah, I'm sure that Michelle will be able to give more details about it, but uh, it just just makes sense to have open search as a one possible way for one possible application for people to consume on Charm Hub, um, or and and of course that we are reaching out to to you folks because uh, you cannot develop a Charm operator if it's not with the upstream community. Charm operators must be uh, developed uh, very closely to the people who know best how to operate this 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 workloads. Uh, our plan consists into creating a snap of uh, OpenSearch and that we allow it to deploy and um, to install an instance of OpenSearch in any uh, Linux computer you have. Once we have this NAP, we can very quickly move on to creating a charmed operator. So start thinking about OpenSearch in a distributed system. This NAP will allow us to run the workload, run the, the, the process uh, in a simple way and the charmed operator will care about the whole distributed part. Then we're gonna create a bundle and deploy everything that you need. Um, to to run open search and then you could do just to, to deploy open search and you're going to have all the, the, the dependencies and all the other services running and integrated as you want also automated releases so as soon as there is there a new open search um image or open search um version sorry release out there we automatically create a new charm operator so the idea is that a couple of minutes after there is a new version there will also be a new charm operator for any human intervention at least an edge version of course you want to um, promote that to, to stable uh, manually. And batteries included observability. So we have a whole observability story at Canonical. And if you have a charmed operator, you can integrate that with one single command. And then you gain access to Prometheus, Grafana, Loki, uh, whatever else you want. Um, so the first step is really creating this app. And uh, that will allow us to very simply install it with one command on any Linux system and say whatever you want about snaps but um again i think we're trying to solve here the problem of giving access to everyone uh, uh, on, on getting uh, giving access to everyone on an open source project and i think uh, uh there are, uh, this is a nice way nifty way to do it in, in linux systems and that's what we believe in finally and i promise it's this is, this is the final slide um the Charming community uh, is composed um, of a few forums, and all our engineers are instructed to, to, to communicate there openly. And if you have any questions, if you're developing a Charmed operator, you should get an answer in a couple of, of, of hours tops. Um, we're also going to be at OpenSearchCon, Open and we're going to have a presentation about our progress and kind of uh, what, what has been our experience so far. Uh, so please. Uh, pop by and, and say hello, uh, Michelle and uh, friendly and um, both crew is going to be happy to have a chat with you. So that's what I had um, for you today. Thanks, Pedro. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I especially liked seeing the picture of those old CDs that uh, used to get distributed. <clears throat> I had seen them at local computer shops in my area. Uh, for other distributions like uh, Slackware 
and uh, you know, really old versions of of Red Hat. But I've never actually seen uh, the physical CDs. That were those distributed widely. Uh, Dave Lago, you said that they uh, they handed them out at at university in Spain. Uh, no, no, it was in Sopa, Brazil. But uh, yeah, you, you did not need to be in a university. You just fill you put your address and your name, and they will send you through mail. Was yeah, a yeah. This was a very long time ago. I'm dating myself, but it was definitely early 2000s, and uh, they used to in some classes they would just distribute them so you can just try them out. And uh, I mean, I don't have one anymore, but they definitely I, I I remember them. Yeah, I think that was about the time the live CD was becoming a little bit popular with like a temporary uh, file system where you didn't have to do anything. It was just kind of things worked in a RAM drive. Those uh, those were good times. And uh, Pedro, speaking of the the romanticism that uh, you feel, you know, that nostalgia, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for that. And so I definitely, uh, I definitely feel that. That was, uh, that was fun to see. Thank you. My pleasure. Can I still get a stack of floppies for Slackware? <laughs> uh, I might have a CD around somewhere, but uh, you'll, you'll have to scrape off the dust. Oh, I remember the floppies, man. 20 yeah. floppy disks, Slackware. Wow. Excellent. Well, if no one has any questions for uh, for Pedro, is it, can anyone? Uh, I, I'm actually kind of curious. Uh, I'm I'm interested in at least trying out Juju Charms or anything like that. Is there a quick tutorial you can point us all at to uh, to get a little bit more engaged? Of course, I'll just pass it into the chat here, and then uh, it should be a 10 minute tutorial that you can try uh, with a fully fledged Kubernetes cluster in your laptop using microcades. So it should be nice 10 minutes for having from zero to hero kind of thing. You know, I think I do remember seeing floppy disks for it too. In, in my childhood, I had to ride my bike to the computer store to rent computer games, and I remember seeing the, the various aisles with the uh with the CDs and the floppy disks and all that juju.is. Cool. Thanks for dropping that link in. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. And a big thank you to Pedro for, for sharing that. Um, first of all, thanks Pedro. That was really cool. Um, it was cool to learn a, a little more about how Kubernetes being is being used and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and thank you to uh, the team here at open search for having me. Um, I'm pretty excited to, to, to be presenting today. I think, if I were to guess, this still still be a bit of a different type of presentation. Um, the way I'm going to kind of try to uh, do it is I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a startup founder. Our team is like quite small. We're like less than 10 people at this point. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about like kind of the reasoning for starting the company, um, what I've been through over the last few years, all that kind of fun stuff. I'm imagining there's some aspiring startup founders out there. And so hopefully I can answer some questions around that kind of stuff. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the company, what we're doing, kind of what our over, overlying premise is, that kind of fun stuff. And then at the end, I'll talk about some architecture, open search related things um, and how that's changed over the last couple of years. Because like, as you can imagine, when we were, when we had like one customer, things changed now that we have like more than 50. And so, um, <clears throat> That I think will be an interesting thing as well. And um, throughout the whole thing, if y'all have questions, feel free to ask them throughout. I'll make sure to do it like a final pass towards the end, um, but I'll also kind of try to keep an eye on the on the on the chat bubble. Um, cool. Okay. So a little bit about me. My name is Jay. Um, I'm working on this company called Highlight. We're currently four, going on five engineers. We're two folks on growth. Um, Harun and I are here on the team. Um, and so we'll, we're, uh, yeah, we're here for any, to answer any questions during or after, um, overall kind of what we're building is we like to think about, about it as like observability on top of session replay. I'm not sure if y'all have heard of like tools like Hotjar and full story, basically tools that let you step through user behavior on your web app. We essentially have built like a core replay tool where we actually let you see what a user was doing on your web application. And then on top of that, we superimpose relevant engineering observability data to help you actually debug what was going on with your user experience. Um, so if you can think of like, let's say 
Nate was on your web app and complained that a button didn't work or whatever, how do you go about debugging that type of thing? Um, there's lots of like logging and monitoring tools out there, of course, but often there are bugs that aren't actually quantifiable. And we're trying to sort of help teams with web apps actually debug and, and kind of take the mystery out of that, that type of debugging. Um, okay, so a little bit about like kind of the background about starting the company and all that kind of fun stuff. Before this, I worked on a company called, um, well, maybe that's not that important. You wouldn't really know the company, but we, we, I worked on a company called Reploy. We went through Y Combinator before this. Um, I worked on that company for about a year. Um, and then there was sort of an aqua hire situation after like sort of eight months or so. Um, it was also in the dev tool space. And kind of the cool thing about that company and that experience generally was that I was in a, what they call like groups within YC, where you're basically grouped among a bunch of startup founders in, in similar spaces to you. And so I was in a group of a bunch of dev tools founder, uh, like dev tool startups, and was had the ability to sort of ask questions and understand what types of companies were working and what kind of companies weren't working. Um, sort of two big learnings from that were one that um, I realized that like kind of time to value in these types of things are very important. So like open search. It, it being super easy to install and just like spin up on AWS or whatever. It's very important that you can kind of like click a button and get something working. And what I noticed was that there were a lot of companies in our batch at the time that weren't doing so well because it took so much time for their customers to actually like get that first aha moment, right? Um, and that was sort of a learning that we probably could have done better with the last company and kind of was one thing that I thought a lot about when I was working on, started working on Highlight. And then the second thing was kind of like what I talked about earlier about um, the other session replay type tools out there that people were using and what why engineers had started to use these types of tools over the last three or four years. Um, and so with both of those two types of things, um, I kind of figured that I learned a lot in, in terms of like from this last company to this new company. Um, and yeah, figured I'd share. I don't know if folks have questions about like the Y Combinator uh, situation and what that type of experience looks like, but happy to answer those things. Um, in any case, a quick brief company intro. Um, the team is quite small, as I said, we're four engineers. Um, we're definitely hiring right now. Uh, and we have uh, a little more than 50 paying customers at this point. Um, the kind of interesting thing about Highlight is that it's a very bottoms up dev tool. So we have a lot of like, it's a very, it's a freemium tool where folks can like come on, use it for free, and then they can, they eventually hopefully convert at some point in time. Um, and that's been working really well for us. Um, and so, yeah, if you'll want to like kind of take a look at it at some point, you should do that. But I think this is a good excuse for me to sort of jump into a quick demo. Um, I'm going to... I won't, I won't go too deep into a demo, but I will kind of show you kind of a couple screens as to like what it looks like and stuff like that. So this is kind of what highlight looks like at first. Um, this is when, once you've installed it on your account, ironically, this is highlight installed on highlight. So don't be too afraid about what's going on here. Um, what it's, Essentially how Highlight works is we are like a NPM package, like a JavaScript package that you install in your uh, web application. So if, whether you're using like a React app, whether you're using like a straight up HTML app, whatever it is, on your front end web application, you install Highlight. And we, act, we essentially are always monitoring your web app. And the way we do this monitoring stuff is we'll, we monitor things like network requests and console logs and those types of things. But beyond that, we also monitor diffs to the DOM, to the document, document object, object model. And <clears throat> there's an API called the DOM mutation observer that actually gives us changes that happen to the actual UI. And for example, tell us that this node was added at this time. And this, these are the, this is the difference in style sheets between this node and the previous node. And then we basically collect these things, report these things to our backend, which is kind of where open search comes into play. Um, and then, and then actually have some logic that lets us replay these diffs after the fact so that you can actually understand what a user was doing on your website on top of all these logs and errors and network requests and so on and so forth. So here, what you're seeing is actually like a playback 
like a real recording of what was happening on your on a UI, and I can play through it like a video. Uh, this one's not that like interesting, so apologies there. But imagine that you can see like this cursor moving around on the actual screen, this person clicking, and if they had, for example, a sign up flow issue, right? We could actually inspect the network requests here and see that okay, this initialized session GraphQL request was sending and receiving this data, and this is what broke something. Beyond that, we also let you, for example, act, uh, uh, inspect all the errors on a given session, everything that's in the console on a given session, so on, and for even performance across the session. So like CPU cycles, things that the browser gives us access to at the time. And so there's kind of, kind of like the main way that folks think about this is y'all are probably familiar with like the DevTools console in Chrome. Imagine that you get that, but you get that all the time for all your users, even after the fact, you know? And so that's kind of at a high level what we're building. Um, it, it's kind of cool because I think it's very, very accessible. So engineers install this type of thing and it's like very obvious right away what, where the value is. Um, and then I kind of like throughout the process, we've also learned that a lot of people have uh, uh, uncovered use cases that they wouldn't have thought of. So um, especially for like found, uh, startup founders like myself that, that install this type of thing, we have a lot of early st stage companies using us. Um, they, it, this is actually pretty useful for like, um, uh, like more of a product use case. So actually understanding why users are slowing down on your app or why users aren't actually creating a, fully creating an account or whatever that is. So there's kind of a lot of interesting use cases here. What we've learned is that over time though, people end up kind of converging to using this for the debugging use case of actually understanding why folks are slowing down on their app understanding why a certain button didn't work or whatever it is. Um, so this is kind of like the main part of the product right now. Um, this we've been working on, we've kind of been working and working through this for the last like six, eight months or so. Um, this is live with lots of customers. Kind of what we're, what's next for the company is we're thinking about kind of building a full like observability monitoring platform on top of this. So imagine that beyond this, we report on things like errors. So these are actual I'm sure you all have heard of error monitoring tools like Sentry and, and Bug Snag and things like those. Um, we're essentially thinking of building an error monitoring tool on top of Replay so that, for example, for a given error, I can actually click through all the sessions where that error happened. And this is something that we'll be launching for, for JavaScript. It already exists on the app the second you install it. But we're thinking about launching this for lots of backend SDKs and things like that. Um, so yeah, in any case, that's kind of where we're going long term, where we want to be like part of everyone's full stack, developer stack in some sense. Um, but I think the really cool thing is that it's like super accessible to install. And so um, if y'all know anyone that's interested in this type, this type of tooling or wants to uncover the uh, mystery around kind of what what's happening on their web app, this is this this could be a good tool. Um, so yeah, this is that's kind of a high level overview. Um, I think maybe next I'll go over some architecture stuff related to uh, maybe open search a bit. And I'll talk maybe first about like what it looked like. How am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. Yeah, I think you're all right. Okay, okay, cool. Um, okay, so this is a quick like architecture diagram of what highlight looks like today. And basically when we started Highlight, it was literally just one server and a Postgres box. And we would essentially just write, when, when, we, when, we, when we describe like what a given session looks like, it's actually just a series of JSON payloads. So it's like a G series of events, right? And from those events, there's like data that we wanna index so that for example, a user can search for it up here. And then there's also data that we it's going to be rel that's relatively static, and we're actually just going to uh, uh, build it after the fact on the actual session page. And so all we really care about it is for the playback stuff, and so it doesn't need to be like super indexable or whatever, right? So in any case, at the beginning, what happened was we would send all these events to a single server and write it to a specific uh, uh, table in Postgres. And then after the session was over, we would basically roll up the table and write it to S3. 
And anything that we wanted to index along the way, we would we just we just index it in separate Postgres tables. Um, as you can imagine, there's lots of reasons why this is not a good idea. Um, we it, this this kind of lasted us maybe like ten customers or so. Maybe we were doing like five hundred to a thousand um, queries per second on our back end or something like that. Um, at some point, the big bottleneck is when you start writing lots of data to Postgres at this rate, it actually slows down the actual dashboard. And so our customers were basically complaining that as if we had like a night where we had like a lot of traffic, right after that, our customers would have like lots of issues and stuff like that. In any case, kind of the first thing that we thought about was in introducing like some sort of message queue. And so we built out, um, uh, we, we, we implemented Kafka, actually we're using MSK on, on, on AWS. Um, but essentially we started writing messages to Kafka. We have a worker that actually reads off Kafka and then we still were using Postgres at the time. Um, at some point, the, even that didn't work because post, even if you kind of like buffer events and make the throughput like consistent over time, it's still pretty painful. Um, and so now we're starting to use like Redis as sort of an intermediary source before we write to S3 rather than Postgres. But that's kind of how it's changed over time. We started to kind of like think about how, like what are our actual bottlenecks? And right now a big priority of us is not actually affecting the main sort of database or ground truth data with respect to our actual customers using the, the dashboard. Um, where open search comes in is at some point we the indexing of like the analytics related data for searching for sessions and stuff like that um, became also a throughput uh, issue. And so we were writing a lot to Postgres related to like, for example, a user clicked this button. And so if a user clicks this button a thousand times within the session and there's tens of thousands of sessions, it started to become pretty painful. And so from the worker over time, we started writing to open search instead. And that's been pretty good for us so far. Um, the, the um, what else was that I think so? I think that's, that's actually about it. Like I think for the most part, open search has been, has been use, very useful for like both the indexing of like these things in Postgres where we don't really need Postgres for that use case. But recently it's been very, very valuable in terms of just like speed of queries. So when I reload this page, for example, we can do some very complex queries and they're very, very fast. So I can say this browser is Chrome, for example, and we can do this query in probably like 200 milliseconds or something. The same goes for that error speed I was telling you earlier. And we also use open search for searching for fields. So if I have someone on my team named Nate, let's say, I can look for Nate's uh, sessions and I can search for this like super, super quickly. There's no sessions for this guy. But in any case, it's kind of like, that's 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 the use case for open search. And it's kind of been an interesting graduation from using just Postgres to using open search for this specific use case, using Kafka for this specific use case, and kind of just like going through this step by step. Um, but yeah, I hope, I, I think I think that's about it. I think the last, the last thing I was gonna say was, um yeah i mean if, if anyone wants to get in touch my my uh my email is j j a y at highlight.io um we're also self-serve at highlight.io so if you want to give it a try even if you have like this like side web app for fun that you're like working on or something like that it's like we work with any framework it's completely framework agnostic um and yeah i think maybe more importantly if people have questions about the startup stuff for um kind of like yeah, what the what the journey's been like and all that kind of stuff. Please, please let me know. Um, and again, it was fun to it was fun to give this talk. I, I I really enjoy doing this sort of thing. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming, Jay. That uh, that was great. I I'm actually curious about a few things. If you don't mind me uh, jumping to the front of the question line here. Uh, sure, do it. And so I'm I'm curious about all the effort that had to go into monitoring all of the DOM events that went on. So I know that the mutation observer uh, hasn't been there forever, I think. And so there's there's uh, when I started learning Web 2.0 and how all those asynchronous calls started happening, 
uh, a lot of that had to be done by overriding the event methods and then plugging custom uh, functions into there. Uh, yeah. is, it, does that uh, sound similar to what you've had to go through or has that mutation observer uh, taken a lot of the stank out of it, so to speak? Yeah, I, I would say the mutation observer has taken a lot of the stank out of it for sure. Um, I think in terms of overriding event methods, there are some certain cases like for network requests and stuff like that, um, where we do give you the option to let us do it. And that's all opt in. Um, but as you can imagine, like there's some like nuances to that, right? Where you, you do want to make sure your customers are aware that you're doing that kind of thing in case anything comes up related to what they're doing with their event methods or their fetch calls or whatever it is, you know? Um, but yeah, for the most part, in terms of the actual like DOM recording stuff, the mutation observer is supported in almost all modern browsers, which is great, um, and kind of takes most of the make, takes most of the burden out of that. So, is there have you considered doing some of your computation uh, serve or client side like with a Grease Monkey script? It sounds like a lot of that DOM manipulation and observation. Uh, would fit into that functionality there. I'm not familiar with Grease Monkey. What's oh, okay. Monkey? Yeah, it's just, it's a browser add-on that uh, you can use to manipulate the document object model. And uh, it's basically JavaScript that runs on demand based on criteria. Oh, interesting. Oh, and okay. so okay. like, if you, if you have a, a CMS that, uh, you know, lacks a certain computation, you can use Grease Monkey to uh, make all of your, uh, pull values out of the DOM, run calculations, and then add nodes and remove nodes. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so that, I mean, this is, it seems like a sort of a Chrome extension, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a uh, browser add-on, Firefox it. and Chrome. Yeah, and... The only problem with using those types of things on the client is that we have to, uh, we have to, we, we have to work for all browsers, whether or not the customer actually whether or not the user that's using that browser actually installed something or not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. We kind of have some limitations where we need to use like almost the bare bones JavaScript that's, support, that's supported by all browsers. One thing that we have done though, Nate, is we, we do use like service workers to do a lot of the client side comp computation. So that for example, there's like compression that we wanna do client side, let's say, right? Instead of, you don't, you don't wanna compress on the main JavaScript thread, so instead, what we do is we'll do it in a service worker, and then all of the uh, outgoing network requests to send data back to our backend is also done in a service worker. So we're like not touching the main thread as much as we can. Um, so we've started to do a lot of that stuff <clears throat> over the last um, actually like three, four months. Um, but yeah, that's a, yeah. Interesting. Well, cool. Yeah, that... Uh... It uh, sits well with me. I, I used to write a lot of Grease Monkey stuff, and it's all it's all you know, grabbing things from the DOM, checking the value of the element, and compu uh, computing some various things. But anyways, uh, I totally hogged the the question time here. We're we're on about five minutes left. I wanted to open the floor for anyone else, and then uh, uh, we can probably adjourn. Uh, I'm actually not going anywhere. I don't have a hard stop, so I'm going to stick around in case uh, past the hour someone has a, a question. And has have you had any customers so far that have had a real, like you mentioned, aha moments? Have any of your customers, uh, you know, shared any success stories with you about, you know, we had this really esoteric bug that would have taken us years, but uh, you know, we there was some manipulation to the dom or whatever you know has, has there been uh um i mean i think there have been some interesting things related to like um, sending certain customers like had some like pii data that they were sending from their back from their front end that they didn't know about and mm -hmm. after looking at highlight they've noticed that oh this data is not supposed to be in this place on this person's account that kind of stuff um th so those types of things have happened over the last like year or so um, there's, I think like the, a very common use case for folks is like, I didn't know how to, like, otherwise you have to kind of like ask the customer to reproduce an issue. A lot of teams don't have like the tooling to actually jump into a user's account. And even if they can, there's like weird sorts of errors related to that person being a specific user or whatever. Right. And so a common thing we hear is like, 
I didn't I, like now I don't have to like actually like proactively try to reproduce these errors. I can just jump into highlight and figure out what's going on ahead of time. Um, and so that I think is the big thing, but there have been like a lot of very interesting small things around it just because like people are now like actively monitoring, monitoring the situation. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It seems like a viewpoint on, uh, on your your application that's a little bit different than what people are used to seeing i think it's uh, really innovative yeah 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 it's very it's very interesting it's very interesting i see an, i see a question how do you ensure users data privacy gdpr make it anonymous all that kind of stuff yeah that's a good question julian um so we actually, if you take a look at our docs, they're at docs.highlight.run. We're still trying to migrate things to .io, but um, on our website, if you go to our docs, we actually have like a privacy S like API where we actually let you redact specific parts of your UI that you don't want, for example, highlight to be recording. Um, so that's one thing that we do from a privacy perspective. We also have a thing called strict privacy mode, which will basically put, replace all your te the text on your UI with just random jargon. And it also optionally won't record the emails of your customers and stuff like that. So if you are allowed to search for a customer based on like a UID or something rather than an actual email, you could do that with Highlight too. Um, so we, we kind of like give you as much flexibility as we can. And we do have some customers in like uh, specific uh, uh, domains that are very sensitive to, this, to that thing. So that's not a question we don't get, you know? Um, that's a good question though. I can I can I can link where that is in our docs. Okay, well I think we are at time. I'd like to formally conclude our our community meeting here and and thank everyone for coming. Uh, don't forget about Open Search Con and uh, it's it's nice to see the attendance starting to go up a little bit. I I genuinely appreciate all the company here every two weeks. Uh, so so thank you for that, everyone. It's uh, it's nice to finally have a community. Uh, you know, to, to get behind. So I, I, I really do uh, genuinely appreciate all of it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, folks.